thank you to uh, the Wild Poppers Collective. You know, I, it's always a good sign when you uh, come to a uh, to an event and the cupcakes with the title spelled out. <laughs> but somebody ate the E in Scruggle, and I want to know who ate the goddamn E. <laughs> my name is Kazemi Balagoon. Um, I am a um, I'm actually celebrating my 20th year in the Scruggle. Right. Um, I, I became a communist when I was 16 years old. Um, and during the Los Angeles, uh, witnessing the Los Angeles Rebellion, and Philadelphia's always meant something very special to me. Um, in 99, I came here to occupy the Liberty Bell. Um, in 2000, I fought in the streets of the RNC. So when I come to Philadelphia, you know, it means, um, it means business, not business, but business. You know, <laughs> coming down to Philadelphia, and y'all are just so wonderful, and you guys are so good looking. And um, if you're ever in the West Village, come see me in the Breck Forum. You guys are more than welcome, you know. If you find me, I'll buy you a drink. <laughs> um, I want to I talk a little bit about love. I've been asked to speak about love and struggle. Um, and I'll be brief. Um, I want to talk first about, about my son, Miles. Um, he's seven months. He'll be seven months next week. And, um, and he was actually born in the struggle. Um, his mother, my, my partner, Claudia, um, walked, we walked two miles after a Troy Davis rally in New York City and she was nine months pregnant. And I said to Claudia, I said, you know what, that baby's gonna come out and keep walking like that. She said, don't worry about it, you know, we do. And we were, we were, we were scheduled to go to the occupation the next day, and at midnight, you know, Miles was like, there's too much action going on, I gotta get out of here and come out. And I oftentimes think about the, uh, the occupation in the same way I think about my son when I first held him, because I looked at him and I said, wow, you look a little bit like me, a little bit like Claudia, you know, you look, you look like a little bit of a hot mess, but they're cute, I'm taking you home. <laughs> and the same thing with the occupation. There's like a little bit of a left, a little bit of nationalism, but, you know, a little cute, but I decided to take it home anyway. <laughs> um, I want to tell you a little bit of story. I've been asked to talk about love and stuff. I'm going to tell you a little story about me writing my first letter to David Gilbert, which happened yesterday. I felt a little bit delegitimized to come here and speak tonight on his book, and I had it actually written to David Gilbert himself. And, um, and I've known David through his, his writings and his video, but I never took the step to write to him, and oftentimes thought about why. Um, one of the reasons why is because you know we live in a technology, technological society that, that puts a high premium on convenience rather than struggle. So it was very easy for someone to come to me on the Q train and say, hey, Kazembe, congratulations to your son. And I'm like, well, who are you? And they're like, no, I'm your friend on Facebook. <laughs> Don't you know me? And I was like, no, I do not know you. <laughs> and so to write to David Gilbert is to engage in a level of intentionality to create a level of community with somebody, to a direct person, right? right? The second part of that, too, was the actual writing itself. Because oftentimes, you know, we, we write in symbols and signs, you know, we just, you know, we like something, we like that. <laughs> you know, we got smiley faces. <laughs> but to actually sit down in a place, in a desk, to think about something, what to write, it requires a level of reflection of thinking, right? And that's within the context of a movement activity. And David, in his book, talks a lot about reflection and theory, right? And I will tell you something, for anyone who knows anything about the left, you know, trees will die on the left, because they read problems all the time. <laughs> we write a lot of books, a lot of pamphlets. We killed a lot of trees. But then there's another part to it, too, right? When I finally got the letter out, and I finally wrote down, introduced myself, talked about the book that I did, talked about my son, talked about how important the book was, how great it was, and how I really, really appreciated this gift of the movement, I had to do something else. I had to go somewhere to the post office <laughs> and mail the letter. That is a hard So it forced me out of my house to go someplace to mail this letter. And when I got to the post office, you know, I bought some stamps, and I can make this kind of make this kind of aside. 
I just want to kind of make this quick aside. I noticed that once the post office started printing a lot of black stamps, particularly black stamps of black communists, they started cutting the post office funding. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because, like, you know, that's some, that's some shit that we want. Because, you know what I'm saying? If you were said in 1989, they don't put nothing on my heels on stamps. Yo, the post office started putting black communists on stamps. We got Richard Wright, Du Bois, Paul Robeson. You got Lauren Hansberry. You got a bunch of black communists on stamps. You can choose out any black communist you want. Put on a stamp. <laughs> So I go down there and I say, who's the black communist of the month? <laughs> I want the black communist thing. I know you got it. You know, they're like, no, you know, we're all out of, you know, heavy headboard or whatever. Um, <laughs> so I got John Johnson, right? That was the, that's what I had, John Johnson, right? The editor of everything. Then I got into a conversation because the person at the, the counter, because, you know, I don't just mail it. I make it into a whole entire ceremony, right? I announced myself in the post office and I go to the guy, actually hand him the letter, her the letter actually in this case. And she noticed, she was like, well, what, were you writing to a prisoner? And I was like, yeah, I know this guy, I don't know him, but you know, I read his book, he's really great. And she was like, oh wow, you know, he, that's really dope. You know, um, back in the day, she was an older sister, back in the day, you know, I used to write letters to Free Angela Davis. How would that conversation ever happen? That wouldn't have happened on the internet. Yeah. So now, then she was like, fine, then she just kind of, you know, she charged me for one stamp and gave me a book of stamps. <laughs> <laughs> then we had a conversation, and I knew she was a comrade. She, we talked about the post office struggle, and the fact that my father worked in the post office. And, and I say that to say is that when you see a book like this, right? This book, which I hope everyone gets a copy of, right? And I hope that we can form study groups around the book. Mm-hmm. I hope that we can form study circles around the book. We have a book club, we can do the book of the month club. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Use this book in your struggle, because this book is not to be uh, um, just to simply uh, going back in the day, but it's going to be something to, to make us go further in the struggle. It's a gift, right? That all of this came out of the level of intentionality that our prisoners give to us right. as a gift. When I read Malia's letters, not a typo, not a, not a misspelling, you know what I'm saying? The impeccable ability of the embodiment of, lit- of, of, of being an embodiment through your words is so important. And that brings us to the question of love. Because I like to say, you know, love is, and this is not my quote, this is a quote of Cornell West. So don't go on Twitter saying I said this. What I said this. <laughs> love is what justice looks like. Is what justice looks like in public. And so when I see this book, I see love. And I think about that too because honestly, the signs are changing. You know, I want to. I want to say something. And, I, and you know, um, there's a song that's very popular that I saw the other day. Um, by Jay-Z and Kanye West called Niggas and Pats, right? And they talk, they celebrate commerce culture, and they celebrate clothing, and they celebrate riches. The name of their album is called Watch the Throne. And there's something very pornographic about that. Because when you think about pornography, right, it always switches the gaze, and what's on the bottom turns up, and what's on the, the top turns bottom, and so there's, a certain, so there's a certain way we look at that, right? And so when they came up with the song, Niggas in Paris, they were not referencing you know, Richard Wright or James Baldwin or any other the black folks that went to Paris to escape U.S. racism, right? It was a celebration of U.S. hegemony. You know, at the same time, black folks from West Africa and Algeria and wherever in Paris, are being subjugated to the worst t- treatment and brutality you can imagine. Same thing in 2008 when 2008 when the president, not our president, the president, mm-hmm. went to the Brandenburg Gate and celebrated, and, and 200,000 people came out, Germans came out to celebrate the black candidate. While at the same time, a brother named Giallo was burned to death in a Berlin, in a Berlin cell. 
You know, I always tell my friends, I had this great conversation with some Afro-Germans, we talked about it, we said, you know what, we're always each other's Negroes in different contexts. When I go to Germany, they love me because they know I'm a return ticket. And when they come here, they love them because they're Zada, right? So there's, so there's a way in which the signs and the visuality are being played within the context of U.S. hegemony. And part of the work that we have to do is reverse those signs and become the embodiment of love and community. When the system was talking about the Puerto Rican struggle, something that my brother Hyde was over here, one of the things I really, really want to think about was a way in which the Puerto Rican struggle used visuality to articulate the demand for the freedom of political presence. Everywhere you went, you saw their pictures on a street corner during their celebrations. We have to do that for our political presence. Hyman right. was telling me the other day about this thing they had in the East Harlem, where like, you know, they would put a famous, you know, you know Boniqua artist behind the bars. And they would say, we have to raise $25 to get this person out of bars. And of course you want to get him out of bars, so you're going to give him $25, right? And that's the way they raise the money for them. We've got to think creatively in terms of the way we do it, because what they want to do is to make us erased. And that's what prison does, is erasure of the actuality and physicality. How many do you want time? One minute. One minute? So she's talking about how to tell my story going. I say that to say, that when we get this book in Love and Struggle, think about the means in which love looks like. What does, ask yourself the question, what does love look like in public? Thank you so much.